Hey guys, this is Matt, and I'm back with another Shooter on Rails tutorial, where today I'm going to be talking about enemy health and some really cool effects. So let's take a look. Right now, whenever you hit an enemy once, and they have uh, more health, they're going to blink red, like uh, this should, but if they don't, then they just die. And so we actually made a lot of changes to the game since the last video, uh, and so I'm going to make a bunch of tutorials about that. Hopefully I don't die. Ah, I did. Alright, well... We get to see our regame, and this time we'll try not to die. And also, I didn't mention it, but there's also that explosion whenever uh, an enemy gets hit. And if we can make it to that mech boss in the distance over here, then I can show you uh, how we added some animations to our uh, hit scripts. So every time the enemy gets hit, it will also display an animation of the part that got hit or whatever animation you want to play. Alright, so we're at the mech boss. So now every time you hit it, it uh, gives it a little wiggle. It's just a little wiggle every time you hit it. And if you hit it enough, you kill it, hit this part until it dies, and then everything blows up. There's multiple explosions uh, in different areas then you fly off into the distance, and that's the uh, end of that. All right, so let's take a look at some of the scripts that are helping us out. So we're gonna take a look at our enemy health script and some of the variables that we're using. First, we have the health, which is the health of the enemy that the script is attached to, and then number of explosions is the number of explosions that are generated whenever this enemy is destroyed. The explosion position variance is going to be the variance in position in which uh, all of the different explosions uh, show up. So like in the mech boss, Whenever the body got destroyed, it spawned about 12 explosions all in different areas inside of where the body was. And then we have a blink time, and that is the little red blinking effect that you saw. So you just have a 0.3 speed at which the enemy blinks, and if that gets set to zero, then the enemy won't blink. So that's a way of controlling whether or not you want that feature on the enemy. And then we also have a god mode. So some of the enemies you might not want to be able to die, like the body of that mech was actually an enemy, because I wanted it to spawn explosions after everything died. But I didn't want the player to be able to kill it directly, because I wanted them to shoot the right and left arms. So I turned god mode on, so the body couldn't be destroyed by the player and could only be destroyed in script. Which is what makes us able to display the damage animation of an enemy whenever it gets hit. We also have an array of mesh renderers, which is every mesh renderer that is attached to this uh, parent game object. So everything, every mesh renderer that is under this game object is inside of this list. And then we have a blink speed, which is the speed of the damage blink. So right now it's just hard-coded to 0.04. And then the color is also going to be red for the blinking. Then you have a list of natural colors. So whenever you blink, you change the color of the mesh to red, but then you need to change the color back to its original color. But then you need to change it back to its original color. Then we also have a property, max health, and that gets set inside of the start method. And then we have our health property. And we'll just go over it real quick. So whenever you want to get the health, we're just going to return our underscore health variable and whenever you're setting it we're going to test if you're in god mode and if you are then we're not going to damage the enemy otherwise then we update the health variable and if it's less than zero then we're going to tell the enemy to die and if it's not then we're going to start our coroutine that displays the hit on that enemy so inside of our start method we set the maximum health equal to the enemy's current health so we assume that the maximum health is whatever we set it to at the beginning of the game and then we're going to populate our mesh renderers list and we do that by calling transform and get components in children mesh render. This is actually going to return the mesh render attached to the parent and the mesh renderers of all the parent's children. So that's something useful to know. And then we're going to get the animator by getting component animator. And now we need to populate our natural colors array. So we initialize it with the size of our mesh renderers list. And then we have a for loop going from zero to the length of our list. We're going to set the color at the x index equal to the mesh renderers color at the same x index. And that's all we need for our initialization. Going down to our animate hit coroutine, the first thing we do is get the start time of the coroutine and initialize a counter at 1. Then we need to make sure that we actually have an animator attached to the script by checking if it's null. And if it's not null, then we're going to call set trigger damage, which is going to cause the damage trigger to be called. So let's take a look at that state machine. So here's a state machine for the right cannon of our mech boss, and it's very simple. The default state is our damage state, and we have a transition here which gets called every time the damage trigger is set, and it's that simple. 
Coming back to our script, after we've set the trigger damage, we've shown the damage animation. Now we need to see if we want the enemy to blink whenever we hit it. So we'll go into a while loop, and while the current time minus the start time is less than the amount of time we're supposed to be blinking, we're going to keep blinking. And we do that by calling this if statement. So if counter mod 2 equals 1, basically if counter is odd, we're going to set color for meshes the blinking color which is red. Else, we're going to set the colors for meshes, the natural colors, what they used to be. Then we're going to increment our counter and then yield for the blink speed time. And at the end, just in case we accidentally left our enemies red, we're going to set colors for meshes, natural colors. And let's take a look at this method. So we actually have two methods to set the colors for our meshes. One of them takes a colors array and the other one takes a single color. So in set colors, we're going to go from zero to the length of our list and just set the color of our X mesh render equal to colors X. And inside of just the set color for meshes, we set every mesh render's color equal to that same color, which is the red damage indicator. All right, so that's it for damaging the enemy. Now we gotta take a look at whenever it's time for it to die. So whenever the death method is called, we're going to get each enemy health script that is in our children's component. And since it will return the enemy health that is attached to this object, so this enemy health instance, we don't want to call death again, or else that'll cause an infinite loop. So we'll check if the child is equal to this, and as long as it is not, then we're going to make sure we call death on all of the children. And now that we did that, it's time to create our explosions. So from zero to the number of explosions, we're going to get an explosion from our prefab accessor, and we get that by giving it the transforms position and the position variance so that it can choose where the explosion will originate and out of there we get an explosion. Now all we have to do is call explode on that object and give it x which is actually a time delay. So if you notice whenever we killed that mech boss all of the explosions happened at a different time. They didn't all happen at once and it gave it just a slightly better look and we did that by passing it x and telling it just to wait for however many seconds times x. And after that, we destroy the game object. So let's take a look at our explosion script and see how we made that explosion. Now, the first thing that I have to say is that I found the explosion prefab on the Unity Asset Store. And let's just take a look at the default prefab. So this is a prefab that I found in the Unity Asset Store. And we can take a look at it if we start the game. Here it is. So this is all it's doing right now is just kind of looking like a ball of fire in the air. But what the script that I added does is it makes it to where it expands and also fades away using alpha. So let's go back to the explosion script and take a look at how we made it expand and then also fade away. First, there are two public variables, which are blow up factor and blow up duration. So the factor is basically how fast it will expand, and the duration is how long will it last. And then for the private variables, we have an original scale, which just keeps track of the original size of the explosion so that we don't lose it whenever we reuse the prefab, an audio source because it emits a sound, and explosion material, which is actually a script that came with the prefab and controls slight variances in how it looks. And then finally, we get the renderer component so that we can turn off the render. And on awake, we set those variables. Original scale is the local scale, so the first scale of that object. We get the audio source, we get the explosion material, and the render component is render. So looking back at that explode method that our enemy health script called, it is right here, and we pass it that time delay magnitude. And right from there, we're just going to call another start coroutine. And we're doing this because we destroy the enemy health script right after we call explode. So if we were or to start the coroutine inside of enemy health, it would actually stop it from running whenever that script gets destroyed. So we pass that initialization onto the explosion script because it's not going to be destroyed. And inside of our explode coroutine, which takes the same values as explode, we're going to turn the renderer off because we want it to be invisible while the time delay passes and we yield for a time delay. And right now it's hard coded to 0.1 seconds. After that passes, we turn the renderer back on so that it can be seen and continue with the coroutine. So we're going to get the explosion sound from our prefab accessor. And we're going to do that by getting a list of 
destruction sounds and then calling the get random sound on that list and all that's going to do is return a random sound I'm not going to cover this because it can be its own tutorial video altogether so after we have the clip inside of our audio source we're going to play it and that's what plays the destruction sound and also another gotcha is that if you were to start playing a sound on an object that you're destroying and destroy it that sounds going to stop so that's just another reason to put that onto a script that you're not destroying now we're going to get a slight variance on our duration and we're going to do that by getting a random value from negative 0.2 to 0.2 and then we're going to add that to our blow up duration so that we get a slightly different size explosion and it doesn't look like all the others. Next we're going to set the frequency variable inside of the explosion material script which is what's on that explosion prefab and this is just a variable that makes the fireball look a little bit more ragey the higher it is or calmer the lower it is. So we're going to set that to a random number Number from 1 to 3. And here we're going to enter the main while loop, which is what makes it expand and fade over time. So just like in the previous script, we have the start time plus the used duration greater than the current time, which is just another way of doing what we did in that last while loop. We're going to continue making it bigger and fade it a little bit. And we do that by taking the blow up factor and multiplying that by delta time so that it's nice and smooth, and then add that to the current scale of the transform. And we do that for both the x, y, and the z components so that it expands uniformly. And now that we have that new size, we're going to set the local scale to the transform size and finally do the alpha. So we get the explosion mat.alpha, which is just another variable inside of that component, and we're basically going to do a linear drop-off. So we get the current time minus the start time and put that over the life of the explosion. So if it just started exploding, this will be zero and this will always remain constant. So, But overall it's going to be zero and one minus zero is one. So it's going to be fully opaque. And whenever it's half of the life, it's going to be half visible. And near the end of the life, you're barely going to be able to see. After that, we just call yield and wait for the end of the frame and start it all over again until the explosion's finished. And then we just call this back in the pool method, which puts the explosion object back into my object pool. And that's right here. I'm not gonna cover this too much just because I plan on making another tutorial video about it, and I don't want this one to run too long. But basically, we need to make sure that the object is back in the state that we originally got it in. So we're going to turn the renderer off, set the alpha to one, and reset the scale to the original scale size. That's it for this tutorial. Thanks for watching.